Let's worship. Have a seat. Oh, good, a response. <laughs> That's rare. <laughs> Welcome, Union Point Church. If it's your first time here, uh, we're happy to see you. If you've been here for a long time, we're happy to see you. We're just happy to see you all here this morning. Um, our mission is that Union Point is a family of local churches on a mission to lift Jesus and others up in eastern North Carolina. If you feel led to give to our mission, there's a few ways you can do that. We have two boxes on either side of the double doors out there. Um, you can give cash or check that way. We have unionpointchurch.com, or you can give online. We have the app, the Union Point Church app. Um, you can give up there. We also have another app because we're super tech savvy, um, and it is called the Church Center app. So uh, that main app, Union Point, that is, we describe it as the front lobby. It's kind of... You know, you walk in and you, you can get your consumables that way, right? Your podcast, um, your sermons, and then this is our engagement app. So it's certain things like if you want to sign up for something or 
Um, if you're part of a community group, that's our engagement app. So definitely check that out as well. And we have a few um, announcements to go through this morning. So first, we have Exchange, I believe. Yes. Okay, so Locus is kind of the way that we are, um, it's what we call like our, our deep, deep, hey, Smithy. <laughs> hey, girl. Um, the Exchange, <laughs> the Exchange, I'm sorry, that just really threw me off. The Exchange is our student ministry, and then we have Locus. That's our Bible study, our, our deep um, into the word study that we do here. And so we're combining those this summer um, into the Locus Exchange. Um, this is, again, for our youth group. There's two different ones. The first one we have up here is our Christian sexuality, um, conversations about Jesus, sex, and gender. Um, how fun is that to talk about at church, right? But let me tell you the truth, as uncomfortable as it feels, <laughs> the world's already teaching that to your kids, so we might as well take back that control. And um, if you're not comfortable with your kid being a part of that, then you have a responsibility to have that conversation yourself and teach them that from the Christian worldview. And that might be more uncomfortable, so I would suggest <laughs> letting Jordan handle it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, next. Uh, there's another one for Locus. Uh, they have the Supernatural, and that's based on Dr. Michael Heiser's book as well. So you can sign your student up. Again, you sign them up for either one of those, and we look forward to having you guys. It starts tonight. Thanks, Lene. All right, next, we have our family picnic. We all know I love the picnic. Um, and our next one is going to be July 16th following second service. How many of you guys went to the one we had recently? <laughs> yes. There were so many delicious potato salads. Um, I tried every one of them, and y'all did great. So I'm looking forward to that again. Um, <laughs> I tried every potato salad. They were great. So keep them coming. Um, we just, it's a time for us to get together. It was really cool last time Dale and a few guys were playing some songs and there some girls were singing and we were all just sitting outside. Kids were kicking balls around and it was just, it felt like family. It felt like home. So I'm really excited for us to get to do that again soon. So please join us July 16th after second service. We will be providing the main dish. Um, if you guys want to bring some sides that are enough to share, we would love to enjoy them. Yeah, all the potato salad, please. Okay, next we have a scent. That is our night of worship. It is going to be this Wednesday, and uh, it really is that. It is a night of worship. So you just show up. We worship. Um, it's I don't know. It's fantastic. There's something about worship that just does something different to people. It touches you in a different spot. So um, if that's something that you are, you know, you feel when you're worshiping, definitely come out and join us and uh, enjoy that time. And next, we have our question series. So this is our series um, we're doing this summer where you get to ask questions, and uh, these guys get to answer them. So that's also really fun. Um, for a while, there weren't enough. Uh, now there are a good bit, but we're still welcoming as many as you have. So if you have questions about anything, um, ask away, and we would love to touch on them this summer during that series. Okay, and I think that's it. Um, I do want to remind you guys we still could use some help in our point peeps and hospitality ministries. Um, so if you feel like those are two areas where you might be able to lend a helping hand, um, please let us know. You can see someone at the tent. You can talk to Teresa. You can talk to anybody um, and see about how you can, you can sign up in the Church Center app for that as well. So, yeah. All right, before we get back into worship, let's pray. Lord, we thank you. Um, for this family that you've put together here. Lord, we're not perfect. We rush in right before we have to get on the stage. We come in just all kinds of ways and all kinds of places, but Lord, you put us here together, and I pray that as we're here um, together, we can just worship you and truly let go of all of the stress of our lives, all of the things that are holding us back from you, and uh, that we just open ourselves up to hear from you. In Jesus' name, amen.
just praise you, Father, for that love. Just continue to be with us as we hear your word. Just open our hearts and give Aaron exactly what we need this morning. We just praise you in Christ's name. Amen. I'm the pastor of the Corner Church down here in Monk's Corner, South Carolina, just outside of Charleston. My wife and I started this church uh, four and a half years ago in our living room, and I remember it was just the two of us, and we, we had our first child, we had our boy, and we're like, yeah, our church grew by 50%. Uh, but listen, it's incredible to see how over the years, God has been so, so faithful and so good at using our church. We have, from the very beginning, been dead set on caring for those who are hurting and lost in our community and seeing them find a whole new life in Jesus. Listen, the last couple of years, our church, we've been meeting in a local middle school, and just recently, we actually secured our very first church home. And I'm actually right now standing in the lobby of what will one day uh, be our future building, and here behind me is actually uh, the double doors that will head into the sanctuary and I can't wait. We're, we're about a month out from seeing all this get finished and for us get to move in. And I can't wait. I can't wait to see those who are, who are hungry and hurting come into our church. And I can't wait to see the baptisms that take place and to see the water splash in the air and to see our, our church family roar and praise in celebrating what God is doing as people are being transformed, being made new in Jesus, seeing lives change and families made new. And generations change and family trees change. I truly can't wait to see what God does next. Listen, we're on the edge of seeing him do wondrous things. We are a movement of gospel carriers set on changing our community and changing the world with the love of Jesus. And we know, we know without a shadow of a doubt that God is about to do some amazing things in the life of this church. We're so grateful for your prayers, your encouragement, your support, because truly with it, we're able even more so to be used by God in this community to bring his love to those who, who so desperately need it in this day and time. Hey, good morning, church. Hey, I'm Aaron. For those of you who don't know, it's good to be with you today. I promised myself I wouldn't cry again this week watching Andre there, but uh, boy, I about did, you know, coming to the podium. Uh, that is my friend Andre Winters. I've been coaching uh, for the last six months, and I've got news for you on the building that he was standing in. He's got sheetrock on the walls now, so that's a good thing. And uh, so they're, they're hoping to be in there in, in July and have their official, like, uh, invite everybody there Sunday on the first Sunday of August. And so for Corner Church, what we presented last week and uh, at East Campus a couple weeks ago, I was able to present it to them as well is uh, Andre reached out to me and asked if we would consider being one of three churches to split $15,000 that they needed to finish the project. And so I proposed to you last week, uh, let's, let's do more than that. Let, let, let's be generous, and I invited you to give. Uh, so today I, I want to continue that. Next week I'm going to continue it as well for you. And uh, so if you want to give to the Corner Church, you can do so by putting in the memo line, Corner Church, on the check, whatever you want to give. If you want to give cash or anything like that, put it in envelopes, label it Corner Church. It's in the back of your seat. Or you can go online. There's a pull-down tab, select Corner Church. All those monies will be given there. But here I stand this morning to give you an update. Uh, and this has just changed in the last 30 minutes. Uh, we have $7,500 on hand to send to Corner Church right now. So... Uh, I told him when he asked for $5,000, I was like, well, let me ask the church if they would want to do more than that. And so, boy, that's exciting already. So don't let that hinder you. Give whatever the Lord gives, right? Give generously. Amen? All right. Uh, this morning, i got to ask a family to come up. I know they don't want to, but Cantrells, would you come on up? This is Blake and Melissa Cantrell. They have two young boys, Jackson and Clayton, and they are two handsome boys. i got a special place in my heart for little Clayton. Uh, and um, they will, uh, today is their last Sunday with us. Uh, they are uh, being relocated to San Diego, and San Diego is a beautiful place, but it ain't Eastern North Carolina. I'm just going to go ahead and warn you of that. <laughs> um, but these guys have been with us the last couple of years, 
and uh, they've particularly been in our community group the last uh, six months, and so uh, it's just been a beautiful thing to get to know them, and if I find out you're leaving, I always like to send you well um, and pray over you because you, you're, you're on mission. Uh, where you go now is, is a new place, but God has something particular that he wants to do with your family and his great commission, and so we want to pray over you as a church and send you out. Um, I forgot to bring the mic up with me. Is there anything you would like to say to us? Like, man, man, <laughs> wait, <laughs> I told him I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't put him on the spot, but you know, I lie a lot. So <laughs> I can do that here, right? Speak away. like microphones. I don't like crowds. That's like, it ain't going to bite you. You can hold this it up a little closer. This is a completely closer. different vantage point. What. <laughs> um, it looks a lot different uh, than it does from down there. Um, we came to Union Point about three years ago, um, honestly by pure accident. Um, I was coming back from Lowe's and we live over there in Trent Wood. So coming back home, I looked to my right and I saw a sign that said Union Point Church that I'd never noticed before. Uh, and I went home and told Melissa about it. And she said, if you're choosing a church based on the proximity to your house, um, that's probably wrong. <laughs> um, so I said, let's give it a shot. Uh, and right when we walked through the door, it immediately felt like home, uh, which was n not a familiar experience from the past few churches that we had gone to. Uh, so from me, from us to y'all, thank you. Um, both of our boys were dedicated here. Um, they love it here. Jackson's probably watching right now, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> you are. We love you, dude. Um, Aaron, Lene, everyone, uh, thanks for making this feel like home. Um, mm. Thanks for making this tough to leave. Mm. Thanks for everything. Mm. <laughs> I didn't know, Melissa. I mean, I wanted to give you opportunity. <laughs> All right, well, church, I want to ask you just to, uh, in a visible display and of uh, unity here, I just want to ask you to extend your arms towards this family and pray with me as uh, we send them out. Uh, Jesus, uh, Cantrells are a beautiful family in your kingdom. You have great things ahead of them. And so as they make this transition into this next phase and step of their life, I pray that they would see you already ahead of them working, that, Lord, you already have a group of friends there waiting on them. You already have a church that you have prepared, a family there for them to engage in. And if nothing else, you have so much opportunity for them to be ambassadors of your kingdom around them. And so I just pray, Lord, you give them uh, safe travels as a journey uh, to California. Uh, I pray you give them a good time as family as they travel and take in all the sights. And uh, Lord, for Jackson and Clayton, I pray, Lord, that uh, what they've experienced here would only be the beginning of what you would do in them and that they would rise up and be sons of your kingdom. And so, God, we just thank you, and we praise you, and give you all the glory. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, thank you for humoring me. <laughs> Amen. You talk well. Mm. Huh? I talk good. <laughs> all right, guys, well, we're back in our series today um, called Who's My Neighbor? Anybody going and talk to your neighbor since last Sunday? Oh, I got a couple a couple waves, all right. Okay, good deal. Uh, Lene called our neighbor out on Facebook, messing with her this morning, so, you know, that's always great. She's sitting right there, Lene said, I'm not going to I'm not gonna call her out like you did on Facebook. So, <clears throat> But uh, we, we've been talking about uh, who, is, who is our neighbor and, and the importance of that and why it matters for us as a church community. Uh, when I look at the Great Commission, we talked about last week how Jesus said, uh, to the disciples before he ascended, listen, go as you go, go therefore, because all authority and power has been given to me, go therefore into all the nations, making disciples. And, and then he literally gave them a perspective, a vantage of, of where they're to go. And he said, from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. And I, I proposed to you last week how the church, so often we get hung up on the nations, right? We go in all the nations. We like the big spectacle. But notice that Jesus starts with these disciples. He starts in their back door, Jerusalem. Go right where you live and make disciples. 
And for the church, I think because we've been so carried away at times with the, the brevity of the nations and trying to reach the world that we forgot our own, our own front yard and back door. We forgot about the people in our reach and in our context and in our community and in our neighborhood. And because of that, man, we have done a disservice to the commission and kingdom of God. And so now you have the ends of the earth coming to America, <laughs> sending missionaries to reach us here. So the question has to be proposed for us, what, what if we became the neighbors Jesus desired us to be? Why would that actually look like for a people to engage with those around them? You know, your neighbor is those who are in close proximity to you. It's not just somebody who is next door to you. It can be inclusive of that and other people that you come in contact with. So your neighbor is whoever you are right there with in the moment. What if we seized those moments to engage in what Jesus has for us? What if we saw with his eyes in those moments to step forward in it? It was a question that plagued everyone in Jesus' time, and we get to see Jesus actually give an example of what it looks like to be a neighbor there in Luke's Gospel, chapter 10. And, and many of you, we read this last week, maybe today's your first day, you get to read it with us again. We will read it next week as well. But Jesus gives probably one of the, the greatest literary works, the greatest stories that he has told in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Anybody ever heard the parable of the Good Samaritan? If you were here last week, you better raise your hand because you heard it. Okay, good deal. So Jesus literally tells a story to, in response to a lawyer's question, who is my neighbor? He gives a story as an example of what a neighbor is. And Luke records it for us here in chapter 10, verse 25 through 37. If you've got your scripture, you can turn there. It's going to be on the screen. If you don't, you can read it there as well. Uh, but it says here in Luke 10, 25, Luke records, says, And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher... What shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? I love that right there because Jesus gives a response to the man. Hey, Jesus, listen, what do I do to inherit eternal life? And then Jesus puts another question at the man, not just a response, and says, hey, how, what is written in the law? And then he asks him, how do you Read it. That's a pretty important question because it matters how you read something. Because the way that you read it might not be what it actually is. Anybody ever had that happen before? So Jesus' question to the man is, okay, what does the law say and how do you interpret that? What do you receive from it? And the lawyer answered him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And, uh, with, and your neighbor as yourself. That just came right out of my memory bank right there, so roll with me. And he said to him, you have answered correctly, do this, and you will live. Uh, Jesus, how do I inherit eternal life? What is the, written in the law, and how do you read it? And the man answers with something that he would say day in and day out, morning and night, the Shema, as a good Jewish man, he would know this by heart and recite it. That's why he could recall it so quickly. And then Jesus says, notice his answer, you have answered correctly. Good job. Do this and you will, notice the answer, live. Eternal life. How do I, how do I step into eternal life? Jesus invites him to answer. He answers correctly. And then Jesus says, hey, you do this right here and you'll live. Jesus is not talking about earning salvation. He's not talking about earning eternal life. He's talking about stepping into what the man has just said, to love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. Seems like it's done. But then the man, Luke says here in 29, desiring to justify himself. Like we said last week, when you tell your kids something and it's not good enough for them and they say, but mom, but dad. There's something obviously going on in this man's heart and life right now in this moment because he's answered correctly, but he's disturbed by what the answer has revealed about himself. So seeking to justify his position and his disposition in his life, he says to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? <laughs> Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed leaving him half dead. 
Now, by chance, a priest was going down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place he saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, then sent him on his own animal and brought him, uh, set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when you come back. Now, notice here, just to recount a little bit last week, because we did a character study on these people, you had a priest, one that is in service to the temple, to God's people, by going to the temple and serving according to God's will in the moment. This man is probably only going to serve in the temple in this capacity once a year, and this is his once-in-a-year shot. And if he stops to help this man who's beaten and possibly dying, that would make him unclean, and that means he can't enter in the service into the temple. So this man perceives in the moment that his religious duty is greater than the life that's in front of him. The second one is the Levite. Now, all priests are Levites, but not all Levites are priests. Are you with me? Uh, Levi is, was a, a man, and his tribe, his people, according to God's command, were to be the people that priests were called out from. This man is not necessarily a priest in this moment, so it's not like a double priest situation. It's not a double preacher situation. At best, this is probably a religious zealot. He's like the chair of some committee in your church. Not this church, but some other church. You know what I mean? And, and this guy, he is in this moment, decided that this man is not worth his time. He's got other things he needs to do. And who knows, possibly what has happened to this guy is just been bait set up that maybe when I engage with him, I'll be done the same as he has by those who await. So he deems that the man's life is not worth stopping. And then Jesus uses the ultimate poke in the eye by bringing sort of the, the, the case study on what it looks like to be a neighbor, he identifies it in a man that's a Samaritan. Now, the lawyer that proposes the question, a good Jew, he would automatically have problem with this. And Jesus is using the Samaritan because likely the man's problem with his neighbor is with a Samaritan. The Samaritans were half-breeds. They were a part of the northern kingdom. They were the Jewish people in the northern kingdom that cohabitated with the Assyrian Empire when they took over the northern kingdom. And out of that combination of people groups, you had a group of people that came about that were Samaritans. And the Jews hated them because they had their own twist on Judaism. And they, they as being half-breeds, didn't fulfill what they felt like it was supposed to look like as a good Jewish family. So they had problems with Samaritans. They would drive around Samaria and add to the length of their journey just so they wouldn't have to go through that part of town. And it's likely that the lawyer knows in his heart who his neighbor is, and he doesn't really want to hear that it's Samaritan, but Jesus, being who he is, uses the Samaritan as the case study. Now, that's pretty crazy, isn't it? All right, you still with me? Okay. So, what does he do? Samaritan takes care of him. He stops. He gets down off his horse. He helps him out. By the way, last week I said, uh, use just a little example. It's like a preacher getting out of his crown vic. Emma Jeter sent Linnea a picture of crown royal and said, is this what he's talking about? She's from England. She had no idea what a crown vic was. Uh, for those of you who were here last week, a crown vic is a Ford automobile from like mid-80s until basically right up to the 2000s. And uh, a lot of preachers drove them. Uh, a lot more hood and trunk than cab. You know what I mean? Uh, it, it is not a liquor drink crown royal. Anyways, <laughs> I wanted to make sure that we were clear on that. <laughs> so the man took care of him. The Samaritan took care of the man. He bound, binds up his wounds, puts him on his animal, takes him to the inn. Uh, notice he stays with him overnight, and then the next day gives two denarii to the innkeeper, says take care of him, and if anything racks up on the bill, add it to my my account. And then Jesus says to the lawyer after telling this, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among robbers? The lawyer said, the one, notice he didn't say Samaritan. 
the one who desi- uh, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, "You go and do likewise." Let's pray right here, okay? Jesus, thank you for your word. And Lord, in these next few moments, I just pray that uh, as we unpack it, you would speak to our hearts. Maybe today, um, maybe some of us are right there with the lawyer. Like when we read this passage, uh, there's some things that just kind of come to the surface that we got issue with. Uh, Lord, I pray this morning that you would uh, speak to us and move in a way that it is really graceful, just as Jesus was moving in grace in his parable. Uh, Lord, would you call us to truth? Would you convict our hearts? And Lord, would you help us to repent, to turn away from ourselves and turn towards you? And Lord, help us to be the neighbor you desire us to be. So we pray that right now in your name. Amen. Guys, this morning, I think the parable, I think we have to really understand and see Uh, that being a neighbor, being a neighbor is literal. It's literal. This is not a figure of speech. Jesus is just giving some kind of a a quip of a a word for you to hold on to and never put into action. It, It is a literal invitation to engage in what it looks like to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. Literal literally means <laughs> taking words in their most basic sense without metaphor or allegory. I put in here on the back side of that that it's free from dismissal or excusing. You can read this just like the man had read the Shema, spoken the Shema over his life day and night, morning and night, every day of his life. This lawyer knew what the truth was, and somehow he had moved in a position where he dismissed himself from actually doing what the command told him. Really, familiarity with truth in our life, especially if we maybe have been believers for a long time or we were raised and steeped and grew up in the church, really familiarity with that truth can breed contempt. We can easily excuse ourselves out of actually seeing that what is truth must be applied into the midst of our life. So Jesus' parable to the lawyer is to help him see that what he has spoken about, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, is literally supposed to happen in your life. It's not just something that you think on and wish for and hope for, but actually something that you engage in. I think about when, when, I, when we're talking about that it's literal, I, I think we have to understand a principle of Jesus. Jesus was incarnate. He stepped into flesh. Jesus didn't stand on high in the kingdom of heaven and look down on earth in the plighted condition of his creation and just say, boy, I wish they'd get their act together. I love them so much. Jesus just didn't stand by and and wish us well or hope that something was going to happen. Jesus literally stepped into our condition. He put himself into flesh. It was the incarnation of Jesus that is so amazing and so redemptive about us. He became one of us so he could save us. That's incarnation. That is literal. He didn't do it figuratively. He didn't do it spiritually. He literally stepped in to our condition. Incarnation fully happens when we embrace moments to love those we most often don't engage with. That's what incarnation looks like. So in the parable, the Samaritan literally engaged with mercy and compassion. Mercy and compassion. Jesus says, but the Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, the beaten man, and when he saw him, he had compassion. Compassion. The lawyer, when he's asked which one of these proved to be a neighbor, the lawyer said the one who showed him mercy. Mercy and compassion. I thought about it this morning, that compassion is not just something you wish someone, but it's something you're compelled to. Compassion. 
Mercy is soft-heartedness. I love how the word actually encompasses is humanness, to be fully what God desires. That is mercy. Or, or best, maybe we can sum it up like this, it's not getting what you deserve. Boy, the Levite and the priest, they determined that the guy left for dead, he got what he deserved. He got what he deserved. He's an idiot. He's traveling through this past. He knows it's dangerous. He's alone. Boy, he asked for it. It's his fault. He gets what he deserves. But mercy is a step in favor of a situation and a person so that they won't get what they do deserve. Jesus stepped into flesh so we would not receive what we really deserve. So that in him we would be liberated. And Jesus moves in a way of mercy and compassion that the two words you can almost use interchangeably, mercy, compassion, love, they go together like a fullness and projection of what it looks like to fully engage in God's love. Compassion is sympathy and concern for the sufferings and mishaps of others. Compassion. Notice that the lawyer and the priest, they were merciless. They had no mercy. For the one that was left beaten. They moved on and didn't engage. And what's amazing about that is the lawyer and these two men, what's revealed about the lawyer's heart is they're supposed to be people of God's love. They're supposed to be people who are his people and somehow there is no mercy, no characteristic of his love for humanity found in their action. They're a part of the family, but they don't resemble it in any way. They're merciless. <laughs> Here's what I know about mercy. We love receiving mercy, but rarely want to reciprocate it. We want mercy from other people. We want mercy from God. But boy, you slip up under my guise. Just wait a second. I'm going to let you carry the hammer, boy. Because you, you deserve it. We love to receive it but we hardly ever want to reciprocate it. But the mercy and compassion that Jesus calls us into and reveals in the parable of the Good Samaritan makes us see that they are both useless apart from extending it. Mercy and compassion is something you participate in. It's not just something you think about. Mercy and compassion move us to extend God's kingdom. This is what it looks like. Now, the truth is, and what the lawyer was faced with in this literal projection of this is what it looks like to live the Shema lawyer, is that he and we extend who we are. What you extend to people reveals what you are on the inside. How you respond to them is who you really are. And that, my friends, is the hardest reality to stare down. When you come to grips with your actions and how they produce what is inside externally. Jesus brought us into mercy by stepping into our moment. And he looked on us and had compassion and showed mercy, an extension of who he is. I love what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 5. He said, but God, being <laughs> poor in mercy, but God having a little bit of mercy, no. but God being rich in mercy because of, why does he have this richness of mercy? Because of the great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Jesus, on the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 7, records, he says this, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. <laughs> Luke records the same words of Jesus in a little different way in Luke 6, 36. He says that Jesus said, Be merciful, Listen, even as your father is merciful. <laughs> and if you've received the mercy of God, then you must participate in extending mercy. 
mercy. Literally, Jesus says in Luke 6, be merciful. Not maybe be, not hope to be, not someday be, but no, be, present tense, right now, be merciful. Mercy and compassion are not ideals to agree with, but acts to engage in. They are not ideals to agree with, but acts to engage in. The priest and the Levite believed they had mercy and compassion, but they never engaged in the actual act of it. That's deception. That's self-deception. That's where the enemy wants you to be deceived. <laughs> to show love and mercy, that's something you got to engage in. So the man... The Samaritan saw the beaten man, and he had mercy and compassion for the man. This is what compelled him. He saw into the moment. And then it says, the lawyer's response, which one, Jesus said, is the neighbor? He said, the one who showed mercy. <laughs> he showed it. I love the great secular philosopher uh, John Mayer. Yes, the body, your body is a wonderland, John Mayer, yeah. He, he has a, a great song several albums ago when he went this little country way. You know, I think it really revived his career, got him out of that Your Body is a Wonderland stuff and got him more into rooted music, country stuff. But anyways, he says this in one of his songs. Literally, the, word, the, the song is titled Love is a Verb. And he says, Love is a Verb. It ain't a thing. I could sing it, but I wouldn't do it justice. <laughs> it's not something you own. It's not something you scream. When you show me love, I, I don't need your words. Yeah, love ain't a thing. Love is a verb. Love ain't a thing. Love is a verb. And then comes the chorus. So you got to show, show, show me. Show Show me, show, show me that love is a verb. <laughs> That's literally his words. Love is a verb. Mercy and compassion and love are verbs. Be love. Be merciful. Show the world love. Show it. You got to show. You got to show Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Not something you own, not something you scream, not something you talk about, but something that you show. Uh, show means to cause something to be visible. <laughs> I don't love my kids with just my words. I love my kids in the way that I Move in favor of them, even when they drive me crazy. <laughs> to show mercy and compassion. Claiming the Father's love without showing the Father's love condemns us. It condemns us. He's not condemning us. We're condemning ourselves because we say we're people of love, but then we never show the love. The lawyer, the priest, the Levite, they all claim the Father's love because of who they were, their heritage, their position. But what Jesus revealed was love apart from literal expression is no love at all. It's no love at all. Loving your neighbor is not figurative. Loving your neighbor is not just waving them on the way out. Loving your neighbor is not just always nodding and smiling. Loving your neighbor is not figurative. Notice the Samaritan, he showed mercy by doing a few things. First thing he did was he saw his neighbor. He was aware of who was around him. I don't know how you could miss that. A man beaten and left for dead in the middle of the road, that's kind of hard to miss. But I tell you what, many of us have the same experience every day and we decide to go around rather than stopping and being with. Being aware Aware is not just visibly seeing it. Being aware is seeing it and seeing mercy and compassion on it, to engage with it. 
The second thing is taking notice of his condition. The man saw not just him in the middle of the road, but he saw what had happened to him. He had eyes to see. God, help me to be aware of who is around me and help me to see what their condition is. Help me to know where they are. And then the man didn't just stop there, but the Samaritan moved towards his situation. He engaged in the man's moment, his demise, his hurt. Loving our neighbor is more than just wishing them well. The priest and the Levite, maybe somebody will help him. I don't know. Boy, I hope he gets better. Hey, sir, I'll pray for you. <laughs> don't act like you ain't never done that. I'll be praying for you about that. Maybe engaging in mercy is actually stopping and praying with them about it. Not, I'll get to it and then forget about it when you move on. Because i got busy things to do. i got to serve in the temple. I can't be bothered by you. <sighs> Paul, Ephesians 2, 4, and 5. He made us alive together with Christ. He showed us. He showed us. Aware of who you're around. Eyes to see. Efforts to engage. And then the last one is... <laughs> He commands the lawyer, what does the man show? He shows mercy and compassion. He helps him see that it's actually something he's participated in. The man did these things. He didn't just mentally ascend to the idea. It was actually present in who he was and how he lived, which is super offensive to the lawyer most likely because he does not like the Samaritan to begin with. And now you're saying that he's the one that's actually showing who God is? He's not even God's people. And then Jesus commands him. Once the man says, it's the one who showed mercy, that's the proper neighbor, Jesus says to him, you go and do likewise. Do likewise. Do, again, is another action word. It means to perform an action, to actually engage in something. Likewise means in the same way. Do this very thing. It is literally go do. Go do this. Not maybe think about it, not pray for it to pop up, not just maybe one day I'll get around to it, but actually go and do. Jesus literally calls the lawyer to see the man, the Samaritan, and his life, and then calls him to follow it. Go, therefore, as you journey, and do likewise. The Samaritan we talked about, he was journeying. The other two, it never expresses that. It tells me that they had a destination to arrive to, but they weren't engaged in the journey. And the kingdom life is all about the journey because we know where the destination is to begin with. It's bringing the destination into the midst of the journey. The Samaritan was journeying. He was open to what God would want to do. And because of that, he was able to do likewise of that which he had received. The Samaritan showed really who God was and who was on the inside. What I think about with doing is this. Sometimes for us as a church, it's easy to get caught up in doing something. Like you, you can get everybody rallied up around doing something. You know, some initiative, something, we, we all can get moved from that. But, but really, our doing has to move from our being. That, that's why the two are connected in the Shema, the first and second commandments. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's being. That is your being. If you are engaged in that, that is who you are. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That is my being in him. And then the doing comes after my being. Love your neighbor as yourself. So my being is in the love of God. I am being saturated in who he is and how he loves me and who I am in him. And from that being, then what happens? I start doing. Now here's what I, I really don't think we consider 
is that when I'm operative in the being, when I'm accepting and saturated in the love of Jesus, the doing is just a byproduct of the being. It's not like I've actually got to go look for something. It's like I start to see what he wants me to participate in all the time. And often the doing is happening when I'm not even aware of it. It is just an extension of who I am being, who I am. It becomes what I do. Being leads to doing, and doing brings deeper being. Being leads to doing, and doing brings deeper being. Do likewise is to literally embody the incarnation of Jesus. To do likewise. Real quick, right here, this past week, it's amazing when you, you're, you're in the middle of stuff, you always are open to opportunities now because you've got to actually see what you're talking about. Anybody been there before? I was in Bojangles this past week. Jude and I were bacheloring it as the girls were gone. And um, we went to Bojangles, I think it was Monday morning, and we're, we're waiting in line to get our food. We're both hungry, you know. And we're having a little good conversation, standing in line. And I noticed this elder gentleman that came in, and I was immediately drawn to the shirt that he had on. And it was a Moto Guzzi shirt. Anybody know Moto Guzzi? It's an Italian motorcycle company. And I thought, you know, I, I bet this guy rides. And then immediately I was followed up with the word, well, you ain't got time to talk to him. Always that internal battle. So I finally decide I'm going to engage with this man. Sir, do you still ride? And that opened us up with a conversation about motorcycles. Guy's 85 years old, owns a 2022 Moto Guzzi, still rides, doesn't get to ride as often as he likes to, heard about some of his stories and riding in Argentina and all these places. Man, it was incredible. We got our food and went and sat down, and I noticed this man came, and he sat by himself. Well, i got to be honest, I didn't really fully do everything that I felt compelled to do in that moment because I looked at the table and I thought, me and you should go sit with this guy. But I didn't. And then on the way out, I just couldn't help it. I was like, I got I to gotta at least tell this guy we got to go riding sometime. So I swapped information with him, and I said, man, let's get together and put some miles on that bike. And then we texted a little bit after I left. Now, I am not a hero, and that's not to put me on some pedestal to show you. I'm just explaining to you that that right there was an opportunity for mercy and compassion. What, what that man's received in that moment as an elderly man, as a man that was there by himself, I don't know what's going on in his life, but here I am with me and my young son. It's an opportunity to give him value, to extend to him the humanness, the incarnation of Jesus. I don't have a clue what's going to happen with all that or if there is anything going to be happening. But I'm saying there's so many little moments in our lives that Jesus is drawing us to see, to engage in, and those little promptings from the being inside of our lives to the doing, you can't dismiss them. You can't dismiss them because who's my neighbor who's ever around you? Who's my neighbor, whoever the Lord is tapping me on the shoulder about? This is who I need to engage in. <laughs> we got to do Likewise. So, three questions for you as the band comes up. If being good neighbors requires us to literally pick up moments of incarnation, then the first one is, what binds us? What, what is it inside of us, man? It's like that thing of where you're resistant to what you're being called into. What is it that so often binds us from doing Likewise. The second thing is, is what blinds us. What is it that I'm so focused on, man, that I can't see who's right in front of me? It could be being a good religious person. You could be so focused on doing the things that you think is what a Christian does that you miss seeing God's work right in front of you. What blinds us? Maybe it's our schedules. Maybe it's that we think we got more important things to do. And the last one is what keeps us from doing likewise? What burdens us? 
I ain't got time to stop and talk to him. I got 45 baseball games to take my kids to. They've got one more sport they need to be in because I'm just hoping that all this time I'm going to spend is going to pay off in a scholarship and I really got no time for anything else. I know, I'm, I'm hitting your toes right here. I've got really important things at work that's got to be done. I'm an important person. If you don't believe me, just ask me. I'll tell you. It's a burden, man. Jesus said, those who are heavy laden, come to me. Take my yoke, my way, my call. And I'll give you rest. I'll make it light. What's burdening us? Maybe this morning as we answer those questions, maybe if we answer them honestly, the Lord would actually give us opportunity to step fully into being the neighbor he has called us to be. Go and do likewise. So this morning as we take of the table, here's opportunity. Incarnation, Jesus put on flesh for us. Literally born raised, lived, and died for me and you and resurrected on the other side of death to give us the glory of eternity. As you partake of the table today, don't leave it and think you don't have to do something with it. You, you got to leave and do something with it. You got to leave and be the incarnate presence of Jesus. How are you going to do that this week? Go and do Likewise, so respond to the table today. Ask the Lord to reveal to you the answer to those questions. You probably already know them. And lay them down. Lay them down so that you can pick up what he's called you to. Okay, Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for your love and compassion. Your mercy in our lives. And God, this morning as we respond, I pray you would move in us. You would challenge us. You would change us. You would help us actually go and do likewise in our world. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Yeah. Uh-huh.
my blessing, redeemer, my answer, my saving grace. You're my hope in the shadows, my strength in the battle, my anchor for all my days. And you stand by my side, you stood in my place, Jesus, no other name. Yes, only Jesus, no